lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Well, Barbara Pleasant is back on the show today. She's the author of The Complete Houseplant Survival Manual. And it's always such a treat for me to chat with Barbara because she's a master in the garden and at the writing desk. In fact, she's been writing about gardening for over three decades. Anyway, I thought it would be lovely to get one more show about houseplants in the lineup before the focus turns to growing outdoors. And Barbara is just the expert I wanted to chat with. Published back in 2005, Barbara's Complete Houseplant Survival Manual has been translated into multiple languages and is one of the best-selling reference books for houseplants on the market. If you're looking for expert advice on keeping, not killing, your indoor plants, this episode with Barbara is just what the doctor ordered. How to Keep, Not Kill, your houseplants with Barbara Pleasant. That's the topic of today's show, and it's coming up after an update on the listener community for the show and this week's Garden News Roundup. All right, let's get started. I'd like to start out by saying thank you for listening to the Still Growing Podcast this week. And I have to say, my voice sounds much deeper to me right now through my headset because I was eating toast this morning and I had gotten a brand new bottle of Maine blueberry jam. And one of those little blueberries went down the wrong hole. (laughs) And I started coughing. My husband was upstairs and I could not stop coughing. And at that very moment, the doorbell rang and here our groceries were getting delivered. So he came down to help me out and he's like, what's going on? Why are you coughing so much? And so I had to tell him my little blueberry episode. But since I started coughing, I, I've noticed that when I came in here to start recording today, my voice sounds so much deeper. So that's the backstory there. But in any case, if you're brand new listening to the show, you'll probably hear my voice a little bit higher next week. But I just want to say welcome to the show. Thanks for coming to check it out. And if you're a returning listener, thanks for coming back. Thanks for being here. And I always start out by saying that I hope you're listening to many different gardening podcasts. It's such a great way to grow and learn as a gardener. And plus, if you want to have diversity in your gardening podcast, if you want to have many different podcasts to choose from, we've got to listen to gardening podcasts. Today, I'm going to give a plug to my friend Joanne Shaw's show. Joanne is a landscaper. She's got her own business called Down to Earth Gardening up in Ontario, and she does an internet radio show every single week. And she just recently started uploading these internet radio shows to iTunes as a podcast. And so now they're available for you to listen to. So go ahead and check those out. And especially if you live in Toronto or in Ontario, that would be a great local show for you to catch. You can also listen live to Joanne's show on realityradio101.com. They're live on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But if you can't catch it live, you can always check it in its podcast form. You can check it out that way at Down the Garden Path Podcast. In any case, thank you for listening to this show this week. I'm honored that you're spending some time here. And I'd also like to invite you to join the listener community for the show. This show has a private Facebook Facebook group that's made up of listeners from all levels of experience, from experienced gardeners to brand new gardeners. And you can find our group on Facebook just by typing in the name of our group into the search bar. So the next time you're in Facebook, 
Just head on up to the search bar and type in still growing podcast group. And then the listener community for the show will pop up. Just click on it, request to join. I'd love to have you join that group. Now you'll receive a number of benefits that you can enjoy by joining the group. First, you get access to all of the garden articles that I curate for the group. And so you can check all of those out at your leisure. Second, the Facebook group is the only place I go to pick lucky listeners for any of the show giveaways. And last week's episode featured Wendy Kyung Spray and her fabulous book, The Chinese Kitchen Garden. And the winner from our Facebook group is Lisa Lane. So congratulations, Lisa. I know you're going to thoroughly enjoy that book. We'll be happy to get you a copy of that. Just private message me with your physical address and email, and we'll make sure you get a copy of Wendy Kyung Spray's The Chinese Kitchen Garden. So congratulations, Lisa. You know, another great reason to join the group is that you get a chance to interact with the guests that have been on the show. And that was my original intent for creating the Facebook group was that I could connect people. I could connect the listeners with the wonderful experts that I talked to during the interview segment of the show. So Barbara Pleasant is in the group. If you have questions about this episode on houseplants or the other episode when she was on the show talking about her homegrown pantry, about preserving her garden harvest. If you have those kinds of questions, Barbara is a wonderful resource and you should definitely take advantage of that. All right. Now it's time to welcome new members to our group. This week, we welcome Maggie Jensen Collins, Les Scott, Dan Hillman, Stephanie Kellogg-Martin, Marsha Clevenger-Walters, Kathy Bashara Scott, Daniel Ionati, Bridget Coyle, Sonia Burkham, Michelle Ovens, Sherry William Adams, and Kara Hatfield Pitsulka. Welcome, you guys. This past week, we also welcomed new listener Donna Paget, and she said, Thank you for the ad. I just bought the Chinese Kitchen Garden by Wendy Kyung Spray on Amazon. It was on sale, so bonus, and I love this stellar podcast. Well, thank you for that, Donna. Now, if you have questions, comments, suggestions, or feedback for the show, there is a phone number for the show, and you can certainly reach out that way. The number is 865 866- 333-GROW or 865-333-4769. I'd love to hear your voice. All right, now it's time for the Garden News Roundup. This is a curated group of posts and articles that I've shared over the past week with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group, and it's made up of a dozen different segments. Now, what's nice about this for you is that you get to stay pretty up to speed in the news and horticulture and gardening just by listening to this part of the show each week. And you can easily check out these curated articles and posts for yourself because I share all of it with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast group. So if you hear something and want to read the full article, there's no need to take notes or track down links. Just head on over to the group and join. All right, let's kick things off with a guest update. Past guest Megan Kane, who was just on the show recently sharing her Smart Start Garden Planner, wrote a great blog post, and it was called Joy is What Happens When Your Garden Feeds Your Body and Soul. For many of us, gardens are more than just a place to grow food. And so what Megan wrote, she said, before you jump into the garden season, take a step back and think about the role you want your vegetable garden to play in your life this year. It's a great post. Go ahead and check that out. Megan shared the link in the listener community. Again, it's called Joy is What Happens When Your Garden Feeds Your Body and Soul. 
great post. In sustainability, Gardening Jones had a question and they posed on this blog post and it was called, what are heavy feeder vegetables? By contrast, they talked about who the light feeders are. They typically are the root crops. They're perfectly fine in the soil. But heavy feeders are much more demanding. They not only want all of the nutrients that the soil can provide, but they need that to be replenished throughout the growing season. So top of mind, heavy feeders are things like tomatoes and peppers. But in addition, squash and melons can also be heavy feeders as well. So this particular post talks about side dressing your veggies by adding good compost throughout the growing season. Great post, great question. What are heavy feeder vegetables? In continuing ed, the Los Angeles Times shared a fun post. It was called, Why Your Office is Beginning to Look Like a Forest. And what I liked about this one is they had a new term. It's actually a trend, and it's called biophilia. And it's based on the idea that people have a need, an innate need to connect to nature. And they call it biophilia. So they talk about the different ways that you can incorporate more nature into your workplace. In fact, they even shared that Amazon has hired a full-time horticulturist for its hyper green space. It can be as simple as making sure you have big windows and keeping them clean. It's one of the best ways to keep your house plants happy is to keep your windows clean. It will allow more light into the space. So biophilia is this new trend to green up our work and living spaces. All right. The Empress of Dirt shared a fun post in her newsletter last week. It was an easy way to grow avocado from seed. And she wrote this at the beginning. She said, if you've been trying to root avocado seeds by suspending them over a glass of water with toothpicks, there is an easier way. So basically what Melissa does here is she cleans the seed, the pit from the middle of the avocado. She cleans it under warm running water and then she wraps the seed in a sheet of damp, not dripping wet, just nicely damp paper towel. And then she puts that in a Ziploc bag, but don't zip the bag shut. Then you just pop it in a cupboard and you just forget about it. And every four days or so, check on it. Now, When that seed starts to germinate, it will crack open and then you'll see roots start to sprout. When that root reaches three inches long, your seed is ready to plant in a pot. So no more toothpicks, no more needing to try to suspend that thing over water. Just put it in a damp cloth in a Ziploc bag, not zip shut, just nicely put in there and tuck it away and monitor it. And there you go. You'll have a little avocado plant in no time. Also in the How To DIY segment, The Telegraph shared a post called Grow to Eat Microgreens, the tasty garnish that grows on the windowsill. I personally just potted up a bunch of basil seeds. Those are right above my kitchen sink. And that's how I use basil throughout the winter is I'm eating the basil microgreens throughout the winter. So I'm not growing them so that I can transplant them outdoors. I really just let them get about an inch or two tall and then I harvest them and use them in dishes for supper. That's basically what I do with my basil, eat them as microgreens when I'm not able to grow them outside. Now, chefs use microgreens. They add color, nutritional value, and the flavor that they can add is surprisingly strong at times. What's nice about this article for you is that they include a suggested list of plants that you can start with if you're going to attempt to grow some microgreens on your own. They include rocket and nasturtium for peppery zing, mustard, you can do that in a range of colors, purple and green basil, broccoli and peas, radish, amaranth, and even kale. So if you've got that itch to start gardening and you just got a fresh layer of snow like we did here in Minnesota, try growing some microgreens to bridge the time between now and when you can start getting outdoors. It's fun and tasty. 
In the plant spotlight, Mandy Watson of Mandy Can You Dig It shared a very intriguing post about a brand new begonia, and it's called the Cascading Begonia. It was just launched. It's called Sweet Pearl Cascade. And it's a cascading begonia that was launched by Woolman's. It's beautiful. The plants have this full, double, creamy colored bloom with rose pink on the petal reverse. And it smells like roses. So that's fantastic. She also shared a post. This was back in August of 2016, but it was the top five thornless roses. So if you're thinking about incorporating roses into your landscape, but you're not too excited about the danger factor with the thorns, check these recommendations out. Finally, in the plant spotlight, the National Garden Bureau recommends a brand new Swiss chard variety, and it's called Rhubarb Supreme. It's Johnny's most bolt-tolerant red chard, and red chard in general is very susceptible to bolting. So to have this variety that has exceptional resistance to bolting is fantastic, and you can get it at Johnny's Selected Seeds. So check that out. It's Swiss chard rhubarb supreme. In the news, Yale Environment 360 featured a post called Habitat on the Edges, Making Room for Wildlife in an Urbanized World. That was a very interesting article. One of the things that caught my eye, well, there were a number, but this little section in particular I found interesting. Here's what it said. The Federal Highway Administration recently published best management practices for using roadside margins as policy pollinator habitat, with Florida incidentally saving $1,000 per road mile in mowing costs, and Oregon reducing pesticide use by more than 25%. So that was a great win. But this article was full of interesting stats on the benefits of creating habitat for wildlife in urban areas. It was very fascinating. So check that out. If you're interested and you want to find this article the next time you're in the Facebook group, just search for habitat in the little search tab over on the left-hand side when you're in the group. The Washington Post shared something that caught my eye. It said, no food is healthy, not even kale. And the point of this article was to stop referring to food as healthy and begin to refer to food as nutritious. And I like this because it helps me talk about food with the kids, especially having two younger ones that are athletes. The phrase that the author uses here is, our food is not healthy, but we will be healthy if we eat nutritious food food. And he goes on to say, words matter, and those that we apply to food matter more than ever. I really liked that, and I'm going to try to incorporate that with the kids. The BBC shared a fascinating article about snails, and the gist of it is that snails have a homing instinct. It all happened with a 69-year-old amateur scientist gardener named Ruth Brooks. So she started this experiment. She'd become exasperated with the snails in her garden. They'd eaten her lettuce, they'd ravaged her petunias, and they devastated her beans. And so here's what it says. She was too kindly a person to kill them, so she she took them away to a nearby piece of wasteland, but they kept coming back. Apparently, it's Gardner's lore that snails have a homing instinct, but Ruth was wondering if there was a scientific basis to this. She got in touch with Dr. Dave Hodgson, a biologist at Exeter University. They put together an experiment to test whether or not snails had this supposed homing ability. And the result? Yes, they were able to find their way back home unless they were placed more than 10 meters away. The University of York decided instead of using traditional landscaping plants that they would embrace using wildflowers. And they did that with the goal of 
adding more biodiversity to their campus. I like that article as well. And that was shared by Landscape and Amenity.com. Finally, in the news, welcome news out of Scotland. For the first time in 130 years, a rare butterfly was found breeding. It's a pretty little thing. It's the white letter hair streak butterfly. Now, last summer, an adult was spotted in Scotland, but this summer, to find eggs was an incredible find. So here's what happened. The butterfly conservation effort has volunteers, and they sent two of them, Jill Mills and Ken Haydock, to scour trees. And here's what Ken said. We were searching the elm trees by the River Tweed when Jill called me over, and I could see by the look on her face that she had found something. We were both beaming with disbelief and delight when we realized what Jill had found. And within seconds, I was fumbling in my pack for the camera. My hands were shaking. The white letter hair streak butterfly has suffered a 72% decline over the last decade and hasn't made an appearance in Scotland until last year and now this year with the breeding effort. But it is still suffering from the loss of all of those elm trees in the 1970s caused by Dutch elm disease. Growing up, I had a beautiful elm tree in my front yard. In fact, all of Smith Avenue, the street that I grew up on, had this beautiful canopy of elm trees. And I vividly remember when Dutch elm disease came to our neighborhood and and we lost all of the trees. Our neighborhood has never been the same. It still doesn't look the way it did having those beautiful elm trees. But good news for the white hair streak butterfly making a little bit of a comeback in Scotland. All right, in the dream guest segment this week is another designer who was recently recognized by the Society of Garden Designers. This time it's Jane Brockbank. And what I liked about what she did is she created a design that won the Best Small Garden Award. And small gardens are in for 2018. It's a huge trend. But what Jane did is she came up with a very clever way to show off her favorite plants. She put them in individual pots and then she elevated them on a bench. And then that was set against a backdrop of this incredible fence. The Society of Garden Designers said, set against a custom-made wood fence, these eye-catching garden exhibits these little pots, these containers, added instant impact to her contemporary garden, which was named Best Small Residential Garden. I loved it myself when I saw it. I thought it was very adorable, very charming, and such a doable thing that we can all replicate. So if you get a chance to check that out, type in SGD for Society of Garden Designers, and then look up Jane's design when you're looking at that article. It'll definitely catch your eye. And that's why Jane Brockbank made the Dream Guest segment this week. In Science This Week, another article that caught my attention was from fizz.org, and it was titled, At Last Butterflies Get a Bigger, Better evolutionary tree. And this tree looks like a giant wheel. Basically what happened here is that researchers created this enormous evolutionary tree of butterflies. And the reason it expanded so much is that they incorporated 35 times the amount of genetic data that they've been collecting over the years and three times as many taxa as previous studies. So right now we have the most accurate evolutionary tree for butterflies and how they're all related to each other. And that's very exciting work. In shopping this week, Ivy Press has released The Big Book of Seeds by Dr. Paul Smith. If you have a birthday coming up and you need to buy a book, The Big Book of Seeds would definitely be a wonderful gift to give. Just gorgeous. 
Also in shopping, if you're looking for a special gift for someone who likes to puzzle, check out Liberty Jigsaw Puzzles. They have a beautiful one of hummingbirds. This would be a very special gift, and you can find it over at libertypuzzles.com. In recipes, SeriousEats.com shared a post that caught my attention. It's called What to Do with Leftover Herb Stems. And the bottom line is we want to eat them. You know that saying, when you know better, you do better? The author here says, I know better now. I don't throw away the stems of my herbs. So for things like cilantro, parsley, mint, and basil, the stems get used. They get finely chopped and added to dishes, but also stand on their own. And here's a great tip that they end with. Basil stems make a great addition to tomato sauce. So keep that in mind. In fact, the image that they show is just an entire handful of basil, stems and all, thrown into the pot. In inspiration, Nigel Hopes on his Twitter feed shared some stunning images of snowdrops that he had taken. This was over at the Royal Horticulture Society show. And Nigel wrote, it's easy to see why people get hooked on these early flowering bulbs, especially when you can admire their beauty close up. He had this one picture of some that have green streaks on the petals, little blotches. They were amazing, just beautiful, totally captivating. Also an inspiration, over at Noel Kingsbury's blog, he shared a post about Singapore's garden extravaganza focusing on the cloud forests. Those pictures were spectacular. So if you get a chance to check that post out, head on over to the Facebook group and just type in Singapore and Noel's post will pop right up. Finally, an inspiration, Thompson Morgan shared a post that was called 12 Instagram Feeds for Flower Lovers. And I tell you what, following these feeds is a great way to start out any day. A recommended Dirty Dozen 12 Instagram Feeds for Flower Lovers. Great list. In quotables this week, the quotes all have to do with gardening advice, which I thought was fitting for this episode with Barbara Pleasant. Here's one from English Country Lore. Plant the bean when the moon is light. Plant the potato when the moon is dark. Sow peas and beans in the wane of the moon. Who soweth them sooner, he soweth too soon. This was one that was featured in an 1896 catalog of the Germain Fruit Company. Do not attempt too much. <laughs> Short and sweet. Here's one from Thomas Cooper, a note from the editor, Horticulture, July 1985. The owner of a new garden probably ought to spend his first year with his hands tied behind his back and his tools locked away in the cellar. The savings in plants and time would be remarkable. Gardeners know this. But if not restrained, they forget all good sense at the sight of new soil. Here's one by William Bryant Logan, Dig We Might, Garden Design Magazine, April, May, 1995. Never dig without a reason. Here's one from Irma Bombeck. Never go to a doctor whose office plants have died. Finally, this one from Helena Rutherford Ely, A Woman's Hardy Garden, 1903. In starting a garden, the first question, of course, is where to plant. If you are a beginner in the art and the place is new and large, Go to a good landscape gardener and let him give advice and make you a plan. But don't follow it, at least not at once, nor all at one time. Live there for a while until you yourself begin to feel what you want and where you want it. 
Well, that's the Guard News Roundup for this week's show. Just a reminder, you can get all of these posts with links and bonus content in your Facebook feed if you join the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. I'd love to meet you in the group. With that, let's transition to the topic of today's show, how to keep, not kill, your houseplants with Barbara Pleasant. Over the years, Barbara has gently guided so many folks on their gardening path, offering advice on both indoor and outdoor gardening. When it comes to her celebrated book, The Complete Houseplant Survival Manual, Booklist Review praised, Barbara wrote a monumentally comprehensive guide. Barbara's book is expertly organized into three main parts, two plant directories, one for blooming plants and the other for foliage plants, and an in-depth encyclopedia of houseplant care. Here are just a handful of comments that people have shared about Barbara's book over the years. I took on the indoor atrium at my church, and I didn't know anything about houseplants, and they are thriving thanks to this book. Here's another one. I'm a newbie with plants. When we moved to our new home, the sellers left us some of their indoor plants, and we didn't want to get rid of them. This book was great. It helped us find what our plants are and how to take care of them. We are positive that our plants will live well now. Here's another one. I learned a lot about proper watering, what to do with waterlogged plants, and how to get certain plants to reproduce from shoots. And finally, this one. I found this guide to have excellent advice with heavy emphasis put on some things that I have been doing wrong from reading other guides. Moving the plant, bad. Over pruning, rarely necessary. Holding on to sickly plants in the hopes they will revive in a lush display of gratitude. But the best part is that it really covers the specifics of how to propagate, how to handle pests, how to troubleshoot intuitively, and so on. In such a way that I stopped fussing with the plants and found they were much healthier when I wasn't stressing out so much. (laughs) I agree with that. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Whenever I get the chance to connect with Barbara, I notice something that I don't often experience when I speak with other gardening experts. I find myself caught in her current. It's not just that she's ultra knowledgeable. That's always a must-have. It's that she's honed her own insights and opinions on all things horticulture. And her confidence is a byproduct of years of experience practicing gardening. And that confidence is something that I just find infinitely appealing. An award-winning, best-selling author, speaker, and passionate gardener based in Floyd, Virginia, right by the Blue Ridge Parkway, here's what Barbara says in her bio. I have the greatest job in the world, which is helping gardeners find neat ways to make the world a more beautiful and productive place. It's also great fun to talk with fellow gardeners who are a constant source of new and better ideas. Let's learn how to keep, not kill, our houseplants from someone I admire so very much. Barbara Pleasant. Well, Barbara Pleasant, welcome back to the Still Growing Podcast. It's a thrill to have you back on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. You know, I'm tickled. We talked, I think, before the holidays about trying to get you on this time of year uh, to talk houseplants because it is the topic on everybody's mind during the winter. We turn to our houseplants, especially I think January and February. It's such a great time to refresh and, and try some things that are new. And I knew that your best selling book, The Complete Houseplant Survival Manual, was something that we had to talk about. About. So I'm thrilled that you're on the show. People love this book. What do you think the staying power is of this book? 
Well, it's very clearly organized so that you can, you know, find the plants that you're interested in. And it also has kind of a common sense approach to houseplant care. I think part of it is that the book accepts the reality that um, it's, a houseplant's a hard critter to understand if you <laughs> haven't been around them. And um, so it, there's everything from little icons that tell you what the easiest houseplants are to little icons that might tell you about one little detail that is important. For example, some of the houseplants that have long, strappy leaves like the Dracaena or corn plant, the leaves at the end still get little brown tips, which can often be prevented if you use filtered or distilled water. They don't like fluoride in their water. Hmm. So little bitty things like that that are often the, the thing that are that's bothering their plant. Unlike out in the garden, you know, I'm a vegetable gardener too, where, you know, it's wind and weather and insects and, and things like that. In the world of houseplants, you know, you can usually narrow the problem down to only a few few things. So a bigger problem sometimes is keeping up with their exuberant growth. Yeah, that's true. Now, I have to touch back on this uh, brown tip issue. When you see that in other types of plants, like, say, spider plant, for instance, a lot of people have that. Yes, they will do that. Well, and, and if you imagine the job of a plant in pumping water and nutrients to its foliage, if you've got these long, strappy leaves, it's the tips that are going to be the last ones, you know, to get a good supply of nutrients or flush of toxins or, you know, that it's going to be the physiological breaking point there. And and it's a kind of unavoidable. Other problems, not just for it in the water. You could have great water, but if salt has built up in the container, that can also cause leaf tips to brown. And in fact, my editor on, on this book, we discussed, I remember having a discussion, whether it was better to use scissors or a razor blade to cut off the brown tips. <laughs> <laughs> when you cut off the brown tips, nobody knows. <laughs> yeah, you cut them off. Okay, so scissors versus razor blade, what'd you guys think? What was the winning verdict there? <laughs> Well, I think it doesn't really matter. I, I, you know, it was it was like one of those details. A scissor is going to always smash plant tissue a little bit. So, for example, when you're, you know, when you're arranging flowers, you're you're often supposed to use a sharp knife to make a clean diagonal cut, rather than scissors that'll just smash it. But then, woody things you want them to kind of get smashed. So. Yeah, you do. <laughs> so it just depends on what you're working with. I have a question for you. I've been dying to ask you this. I have a question about a mother-in-law tongue plant. Not a problem growing it. It's doing just fine. That's the problem, I guess, is that it's growing too well. It's in an antique bean pot. What was I thinking? So it's in this gorgeous bean pot that I don't ever want to lose. And what I'm worried about is that at some point it's going to crack this, you know, glaze. Oh, it will. And so I'm just going to advise you to go ahead and, and rescue your pot. Okay. Because the, here's the thing, the pot won't grow back, but the plant will. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. You know, what I've been doing is I kind of massacre around the edges of it. You know, the minute I see it start sitting up new shoots, I take a knife and I hack it out of there. And I, you know, I'm really not being that nice to it, but it continues to thrive. But I just well, keep going. Well, it's probably mm. kind of responding to that abuse a little bit. <laughs> Those are wonderful plants. And did you know that occasionally they bloom? No. Yeah, they do. I was a newspaper columnist, and I had done some little column that included maybe, you know, the houseplants that really stay with you because you can't hardly kill a mother-in-law's tongue. And so people will have them for 20 years. And people start, and I said, they don't bloom. And, and people said, uh -huh, yes, they do, and started sending me pictures. And um, sure enough, some of these little equatorial plants that just get exposed to little small changes in day lengths. It'll be enough to trigger them to bloom. 
I gave a Dracaena corn plant that I'd had for about five years, but really I have room for it. It takes up a lot of space. Um, I gave it to my daughter for her office. They had a, a big panel window that people were kind of running into sometimes. Oh. And so it was put there for my purpose to be a visual barrier. And um, it's blooming. Oh, get out of town. That is insane. Yeah, and I think the big change, you know, <laughs> some of the people she works with have said, oh, it's a sign of good luck. I think it's great. I agree. Oh, it's a sign of good luck. This plant that doesn't bloom is blooming. But apparently it gets off an odor or a perfume oh. that makes paper whites look like an also ran. And oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, yeah, really musky and strong. Oh, and, interesting. Um, yeah. <laughs> so they may be cutting them off. Well, you know, I always laugh. You know, I have a Hoya house plant. That's probably my personal favorite. And this Hoya, you know, they bloom. They have this beautiful wax bloom. It's amazing. But I always smell it before I see it because I'm so busy, of course, with the kids. And then I'll walk into the living room. And I'll be like, oh, what's that? And then, oh, yeah, it's the Hoya. And there's a bloom, sure enough. So... When does, that's a Hawaiian plant. When does your Hoya bloom? You know, it must be about this time of year because I'm thinking back to when I've taken pictures of it for my blog and I want to say it's uh, late winter, early spring. I think that's when it's been blooming for me in the past. Well, do you ever trim it back? I have one that sends out its little arms all over the place. Yes, I do trim it back. Um, I left a Hoya. My mom bought our old house. My mom and dad bought our old house. We had bought a starter home and then they were looking for a home to downsize to. So they bought that house. And when I, what I left for her was this Hoya that I had at this top of a, a wall that kind of divided the kitchen from the entryway. But it's like a seven to nine foot tall wall. And at the top of it is this Hoya. It, so therefore, it gets completely neglected, right? Like <laughs> you forget to water it because it's that high up. and yeah. But it hangs down like a waterfall over this wall. And when you come into the house and you look up, you see this wall of green and it's this Hoya and it's just thrilled to death. It's in this teeny tiny little pot. And that's what we did with it to deal with. I mean, because the leaves, it just... It, the arms get so long. But my mom will still come up to me and I have so many Hoya and she will still come to my house and bring me Hoya, <laughs> Hoya cuttings. I'm oh, like, no, thank you, mom. because you can't. I, you well, know, see, she still I have does. plants like that, that, you know, and you live with them a while and, and then go on. Yeah. I had a friend who was downsizing it and brought me a bunch of, of root cuttings because she didn't want the plants that she'd lived with for years and years and years to to be lost forever. Well, Jen, I've repotted and regrown this climbing philodendron three times. And I'm sorry, Ruth's philodendron is going in the compost this spring. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I'll use it. You know, you can take your tropicals that you don't really care for and com combine them with annuals and pots in the summer, and oftentimes it looks really good. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm not going to do that with the Hoya. I was asking the Hoya questions because I have one that I got from a friend, I'd say about five years ago. And um, its growth is very good and and everything, but it hasn't yet bloomed. Oh, really? I, yeah, I know a thing. They take time. You know, when you use your full awareness to imagine what these houseplants are going through, you know, I mentioned Hoya being from Hawaii. We're talking yeah. about, you know, a tropical beach forest in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And we want to know why that plant is not following an ABC <laughs> formula That's right. in my house in yes. the mountains of Southwest Virginia. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, you know, one of the things, and, and I don't, you can't put the same thing on every page of a book, but one of the things I think people need to understand about houseplants is that moving them around is probably not the best idea. You know, the bloomers that um, respond best to, to light at different times. And, of course, you, your best-looking houseplants, you want to put those in the most visible spots. But I'm talking about extreme movement of houseplants. They're not going to be happy because... Plants are stay in one place beings. Yeah. And um, so people will buy a new house plant and a pot and some soil 
and and bring it home from wherever it's been and put it through the trauma of transplanting and then put it in a place that may or may not be right and and wonder why it's not exploding with joy. Mm. I think minimizing how many changes you make a plant go through, especially when you're adopting a plant, like don't rush to repot. Just Mm. slip it in a more decorative pot so you don't have to look at the plastic and, you know, pay attention to how it does in in the places where you want to keep it. One thing that, that I think people underestimate just how good houseplants are at adjusting to low light. Tell me more. They'll put them in too much light before they'll put them in too little. Okay. One of the important clues you get with a new houseplant is the place that you purchased it and what was the lighting like. And um, I would hope that, oh, everyone in the world would have a friendly neighborhood houseplant store, but that's not true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, for example, if I went to box store A and they had the plants I was interested in indoors under artificial lights, and then I went to box store B where the plants are in a glass house, you know, yep. they're, they're climate controlled, but they're getting full light. Mm-hmm. I choose the plants from the darker um, exposure. Oh, such good. Because they're not going to be craving as much light. You're right. Oh my gosh, I never thought about that. That's a genius tip. In fact, I'll, I'll say I have a box store A and that's probably my, what I have always thought was my least favorite place to go because it is so dark in this little spot in the warehouse where they put houseplants and I always feel bad for them in there, but maybe I should think about that a little differently now. Well, they're, they're being given more of a rest break than the ones in very bright light. Yeah. But now... Which is, you know, I guess in my head as I was talking about this, I was thinking about foliage plants, you know, the palms and philodendrons. Yeah. Because we we were talking about Hoya and you were talking about it being used uh, as a screen, as a visual screen. Yep. In the house. And... um, one of the things I've seen in the last couple of years looking in home decorating magazines and, and home reno shows on TV, they will bring in these really big architectural plants. I call them the fiddlehead yeah, the monstrosa, uh, which is not only tall, it's wide. Yeah, yeah. And so it's like I used to have a friend that kind of got into collecting Norfolk pines, <laughs> which I didn't really understand, you know, because they're so wide. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the whole house was getting overtaken. Yeah. Where a, an upright plant is generally more, or one that hangs up in a basket is easier to sight in a, in a house or, you know, a small plant. We're entering orchid season here, so. Yes, yes. Well, yeah. let's make sure we talk about that. I have to say, though, uh, do you watch Fixer Upper at all, that home improvement show? Yeah. You know, John's gotten the flu this week. And so we have been, I have to try to find a show we can watch. And and so we just happen to be watching HGTV and up comes Fixer Upper. And I could not believe, I listen, I'm late to the party. I'd never watched that show before. But what I was completely taken with is the, how much houseplant material that she brings into these new homes. I mean, it's gorgeous. And the house I'm thinking of, if anybody watches it, is go back and watch the house uh, she did for her sister. That house was so loaded with houseplants. I could not believe. I was shocked. But I'm really happy to see that. They're really incorporating houseplants in these home improvement shows. I was amazed. Well, even even in minimalist decorating, there's often excellent... Um, Places in in the main living area um, for house plants. You know, when I, when I say these structural house plants or parlor plants that kind of rise up behind the sofa, <laughs> um, but then then in a smaller space, and I, I like Fixer Upper too because it shows more realistic money than yeah. the Fixer Upper shows. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
<laughs> but anyway, <laughs> you know, there a lot of people are living in small urban spaces. Yeah. And, um, and I think there's even been a, a trend on uh, hot house plants for bathrooms. Yes. Because people wanted that touch of green in their bathrooms, which, by the way, is a wonderful place for the little um, rabbit foot ferns. Oh, really? The, yeah, they're these darling little ferns. And, and there are several species, the deer foot fern, the rabbit foot fern, da 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 But they have, you know, very delicate foliage. They never get more than a foot high. And after they get established in their little pots, they start putting out these little furry feet that come over the edge of the pot. Oh, yeah. oh, they're so cute. I love them. <laughs> I love them. And they're a, just a great bathroom plant. Oh, that's a great tip. I love that. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I guess I never put together that those are the rabbit's foot fern, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Oh, see, you know, there are fewer offerings of interesting house plants these days. And you would think that the age of the internet would have um, made that different, but it, but it hasn't. So with some categories of indoor plants, we have a radically expanded selection of orchids, for example. You know, many, many more than the home gardener could grow only a few years ago. But then there's other little house plants that are wonderful that have just kind of fallen by the wayside. But then it, it could be the that some of them were just a product of history. You know, the plant exploration age yeah. brought us all these house plants that had to be tried in your Victorian parlor. And um, I guess maybe all that's peaked. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk orchids a little bit. I mean, you brought it up and it is orchid time. It's the orchid time of year. There's orchid shows happening all over. People can find them in their own backyards, basically. What are your tips on orchids? Well, I think the the main thing is to, you know, to go in slow. There's a subset of, of people, of gardeners, who get orchid fever and really get into it big. I think one or two orchid plants is plenty for most people because most of the year they're just really these quiet little succulents that don't have much to recommend them. The plant part is not all that attractive. Um, but the blossoms, of course, is a whole nother story. And there's such good ones. Buy one um, that is going to have multiple blooms. And a lot of times those just are called moth orchids because the multiple blooms look like little butterflies or moths. And one that's just starting to bloom. And you'll get, you know, anywhere from... 10 to sometimes dozens of blossoms, depending on, on what it is. So, and, and then when you get into orchids, you can do some of the, like, lady slippers and stuff. Which it's just such a single bang that you get on a, on a, <laughs> a lady slipper. And they're not very <laughs> dependable. But the moth orchids are, and then... They they rest up between blooms and bloom cycles, and sometimes they'll come back once a year. Sometimes there's some. There's one called Sherry Baby that'll bloom at least twice a year, and um, some that have little bits of scent. So it can go in all different directions. But just don't be afraid to to get started with one. Now, where do you, um, where do you like to put them? Where where do you put them by window? Do you put them by your sink? Where you is your do you place? put them near a window with moderate light? Like you could try an east window, um, where they're never gonna, or, or a north window where it might be, you know, close to the window. And actually, a day night difference in temperature is great. And this time of year, we don't you know, maybe recognize that so much. We're just trying to keep warm. But, <laughs> but in the summer, it happens naturally in, in many parts of your house that there'll be like an 8 to 10 degree difference between yes. day and night. Mm -hmm. And orchids love that. Um, so I think those are my only tips is to expect that rest period. And they can, they're very low maintenance during that time because they're succulents. You know, they can kind of moderate their own water supply. If you don't drown them, they'll be fine. Yeah. I have known, known orchids that took, took time to, to kind of settle in and skip a year of bloom and then they got more dependable. So. They're fun. But, they, you know, the if, in the book, we've got 
pages color coded, like the first section of the book has these purple stripes at the top, so that you know that you're in talking about all blooming house plants, and. You know, having blooming houseplants, I think, is just makes you happy when when you're making your tea in the morning to to see that the um, African violets are in bloom or, or something. I know on New Year's Day, I uh, looked over, and the first floret of this orange calancho I have had opened, and I thought. That is so cool that on New Year's Day, January. <laughs> <laughs> And so now I have to keep it another year. You know, it sounds like I, I live in a jungle, but I don't because I, I rotate things out and bring new things in. So, <laughs> <laughs> In terms of blooming ones, you know, I love this is the first section of your book and it is color coded. So this first section has to do with all the bloomers. We can't not talk about begonia. How much do you love those guys? So which ones are your favorites? You know, the ones that have the little purple in them in the in the middle and they've got a ruffly leaf. Yeah. So my mother-in-law grows them in these huge pots. I suppose she uses, uses them more as a cash pot, but she's got them on an east window and they just go gangbusters. Then when summer comes, usually about mid-June, she'll bring them out onto her porch. It's a covered porch. Um, yeah. And so it's got, you know some protection from the sun and she's got a huge tree in her front yard, but they spend the summer outside and then they come in for nine months out of the year. You know, I've done it before, and, but some plants and, and I don't want to point out anybody in particular, I've decided that just leaving them inside is better rather than risking the, the unwanted hitchhikers and earwigs and earthworms. Yeah. <laughs> Things that find their way into certain pots. There are some house plants and the calancho I mentioned is a good example. Holiday cactus is another one. And I also work with amaryllis and hopefully I'm going to graduate and there's a bulb called clivia that I have never had one. And it's a multi-year proposition, but people that have them, and, and I see pictures and I'm so jealous, I want one. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things, some of those benefit from being outdoors. I've even, um, you find sweet spots around your landscape, just like your um, mother-in-law's covered patio that are just right for, for doing certain things. Like I, I know where I can put the calanchos in the summer. So they're going to be exposed to the lengthening and sh then shortening days, which is what primes them for a heavy flowering in the winter. Um, but n not a minute of direct sun is going to fall on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and the same thing, by the way, with Hoya, you can't bring those out and put them in full sun. They've got to be very protected. Oh, yes. I see that my Hoya is in a big hanging basket in the corner. It can't be moved. No. Because <laughs> <laughs> and so um, the, uh, the little wandering tendrils that are hopefully one of these days going to develop <laughs> fragrant blooms are all wound into its macrame hanger. And, um, okay. It's not going anywhere. No, it's, it's staying put. It's staying put. Mine, you know, do you have pest issues with yours, by the way? No, not at this time. Not okay. in the past. You see, if I did with a, a plant that size, I don't think I'd even fight it. <laughs> <laughs> it was like every year I'm so silly. At the end of the season, I'll bring something in. Oh, I'll overwinter this pepper or yeah. this past fall. I decided it was getting so cold, it was going to be three degrees, and these mini pansies, I'll save them. I'll, I'll bring them in. Well, those, the last winter, it was these couple of peppers, and this winter, it was those silly little mini pansies. They're just aphids, colonies, oh. waiting <laughs> to <laughs> erupt. <laughs> like, this is the stupidest idea. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah, we gave those up. Yeah, but generally, winter aphids are the only well fungus gnats in in the spring when I'm doing a lot of propagating, I'll run into problems with those. But other than that, winter aphids are the only pest problem hmm. 
knock on wood, <laughs> that I've had lately with houseplants. I can remember when I was first, I was, I was young, I was just getting into houseplants, and I had mealybugs on my yes. cephalera. And uh, that learned the magic of just the alcohol and Q-tips, and wow, they went away. Yep, bye-bye mealybugs. Enjoy that last drink. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How about uh, spring flowering bulbs? I saw on your Facebook uh, post recently, your beautiful amaryllis are going to town. But I, there's a section in here with the blooming house plants that you talk about spring flowering bulbs and those pots that people like to get from the grocery store now have those. Well, that's what I was going to say. Because if you go to the supermarket right now, you can buy hyacinths. Yep. Or paper whites, or, you know, which look like daffodils. Yep. And later, you know, daffodils. And unless you really love the scent of paper whites, I wouldn't recommend them because it's it's kind of um, cloying. Yeah. <laughs> That's the word I'm looking for. Um, whereas some of the unscented or less lesser scented spring flowering bulbs are better. The problem is it's just such a quick one-shot deal with, some of the hardy bulbs like hyacinth, you can take it after it's bloomed and stick it in the ground and it'll bloom for another couple of years and then yeah. disappear. Yep. But, you know, it's better than nothing. That's right. Yeah, that's right. You know, those blue, you know, it, it's, they're like cut flowers on roots, only the blossoms are not going to last very long on, on the spring flowering bulbs. If I could choose between a calancho and, and a spring flowering bulbs in a pot, you get the calancho. Because it's going to bloom for another month or six weeks. Yeah, that's whereas, right. You know, the spring flowering bulbs in a pot bloom for about five days. And yeah. then, yeah. you know, if I bought one, I couldn't plant it out because the soil is frozen. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Believe me, I hear you on that. You know, what I think is the best part about those little spring grow pots or whatever they're calling them nowadays is the anticipation. It's the fact that the kids get to see those things and you know there's going to be a flower coming. And then it's kind of like all over but the crying when, once they bloom. You don't get a ton of time with them, but you've had this satisfaction of seeing that new green growth that just yeah. can't, cannot be matched, you know, when it comes to growing indoors. It's, so that's the thrill of them. But you're right. Once they start to bloom, you're on the clock. So, you know, another one that's mentioned in this part of your book is Oxalis. And of course, St. Patrick's Day is coming up here. So people will have well, plenty that's of that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. If you want to look for an Oxalis, like there's a really pretty bicolored called uh, Iron Cross that has blotches of um, red and on the leaf and then <clears throat> green leaves. You better shop during St. Patty's Day season or you're not going to find them. <laughs> you know, it's like they, they hit the stores once a year and then yeah. it's over. Yeah, some of the oxalis that have recently been bred uh, are combining different foliage colors and different flower colors. And I don't want to be a party pooper, but... <laughs> <laughs> yellow flower, yeah, orange is yellow flowers above burgundy foliage is just not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> Give me back the pale pink flowers, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the original, the ancestral strain of uh, that plant has pale pink flowers and looks really good. Um, whereas, and, and then they've been messing around with leaf colors and flower colors. Now, in some places, these oxalis are considered invasive weeds, you know. They yes. grow outdoors. They're winter hardy. You know, somebody just posted in the listener community a picture of oxalis run rampant, and it's the bane of her existence. And I'm like, hey, you know, well, first of all, as someone who has attempted to grow oxalis indoors as a houseplant or, you know, gets it as a gift this time of year, let me tell you what happens to mine and then tell me what I'm doing wrong here. But they get leggy, they flop over, and within, I don't know, 60 to 90 days, I've basically got just a couple of stems left. I get so disgusted with it, I toss it out. 
what am I doing wrong that I can't get this thing to, to really you be know, happy You know, I here? think what you've got is a situation where plant, the plant you were given or you purchased or you purchased had been given a lot of strong light and a strong light that you do not have in mm-hmm. your home because there was such pressure on these little plants yeah. to look pretty for St. Patty's Day so <laughs> somebody will adopt you and take you home. <laughs> And and so they'll use, you know, a light and nutrient regimen to make them look like a Pinterest, you know, um, shamrock plant. Yeah. And then you you put it in what seems like a good place in your house and it's, you know, oh, where am I? What's happening? You know, when when any plant is subjected to very strong light, it develops layers of these little organelles called chloroplasts in the leaves. Whereas a leaf that grows under a low light situation, it's going to have fewer. They're not all bunched up in layers. You know, it's just how the plant equips itself to make good use of light. And so, you know, the changes of going from a, you know, I've got all the light I'll ever want, light to burn attitude of a plant to, oh, I'm starving for light. Is kind of maybe what they're going through. You know what I do with plants that are not really happy during the spring period when cloud cover makes a difference too. And as long as the weather's cloudy, <clears throat> even if they're in your sunniest window, they're not getting a lot of light. Is I just kind of try to keep them happy until May when it warms up outside and then put them outside. And a lot of times they just come back. Okay. My amaryllis, it's all leggy or will be. By the time my last frost passes sometime in April, it'll look like it's ready to go dormant, and I'll put it out in the pack of Sandra bed where it only gets an hour of sun every day, and they come back to life. It's like they start developing new foliage. A lot of times they'll bloom. Yeah, so. yeah, they do bloom. You know, I had thrown some amaryllis out. I I, I pitched them right out my front door, and um, they landed among my ferns. <laughs> my my uh, right in front of my front door is my my flower garden, but right in that corner is it's north facing and it's it's protected by all this all these ferns, all this you know foliage. You can imagine I've let these ostrich ferns go bananas. And after a couple months, I look and here I have these thick, fleshy stems coming out and and leaves coming out among these ferns. And I'm like, what is that? And here it was my amaryllis that had just decided it was deliriously happy there among the among the ferns. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> they will surprise you sometimes. They will surprise you. Um, we got to talk Christmas cactus here and then let's move into the next section. But tell me a little bit about your thoughts on Christmas cactus. So many people have those, love those, or maybe even struggle with them. So let's help them out. Well, I think that is one plant that um, it can really pay quite a bit of neglect. And it, it communicates clearly. You know, when it's bone dry, the branches start drooping and shriveling up. <laughs> and when it when it looks well formed and perky, it, things, things are pretty good. I I have several of those, and I make no attempt to tell them when to bloom. Okay, they're gonna bloom during the shorter days from November. I have one that does a little repeat performance in March. All right, you know, like it starts blooming in spurts and. And December, and it doesn't really quite finish up <laughs> until March. But then, then there, and I, I think of the spring months as kind of a rest period for them. I'll move them into a place where they're not getting a whole lot of light, and I'm not letting them dry out. But you know, there's no party going on here. <laughs> and um, then consider summer their growth period, summer to fall. And I like to have them outside in the shade. Um, finding the right spot is not always easy. We have a an open but covered carport slash woodshed. <laughs> and I have found that I can keep them up under there, and, and they're real happy. They never get sun, but they get good indirect light all day. And then I'll bring them in in um, late September when the nights start 
getting chilly, and they just know what to do. You know, they're easy. Huh. And how about African violets? I, I have to make sure we cover that as well. Do you have a lot of African violets? Do you like to grow them? No, I, they come and go for me. Um, I'm not a, um, I love African violets. I think they're darling and I love the petiteness of them. And, you know, people that like little, if I had a teacup collection, I'd have an African violet collection too. Um, <laughs> But I do like African violet pots an awful lot. Those are the two part pots where the top part sits in a reservoir yes. of water. Yes. Those will make any house plant happy. You don't have to reserve use of those two part pots. You know, the the ones that sit in the water for African violets. Other plants love them. What other plants do you like to pop in there? Well, I'm a propagator. <laughs> <laughs> And so it varies. Right now I'm I'm trying to give away Maranta plants. And um, like you, I have a, a mother-in-law's, one of those miniature mother-in-law's trunks that um, I took to the plant. We had a plant swap here locally on Saturday. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, when you, it's out of the old and with the new sometimes with these things. So when something wants to be propagated, I'll propagate it and... Those African violet pots are great for that. So. You know, your next section of your book talks about foliage plants. And I yeah. saw a post that you had shared in the fall about your rubber plant, which I didn't know was so easily propagated and, of course, has those huge leaves. Very impressive. But tell us about that. Well, you know, it's, it's um, that's ficus elasticity. I don't think I'm leaving on a syllable there, but anyway, the familiar rubber tree, a rubber plant, you can take the stem tip, you know, and leave two or three leaves on it and take the others off, you know, like a 10 inch long stem tip and stick it in water and it will root. I know the ones you're talking about um, because I got tired of that plant (laughs) and I wanted a bushier um, rubber plant. I've, I've been having these upright rubber plants, and I wanted a bushy rubber plant. Okay. So I decided to top those off because I had seen evidence that there were these secondary buds lower down that wanted to grow. And in fact, right now, it's kind of the same issue you're having with your bean crock. I put them in um, a glass bottle that's very thick and nice that somebody had given to me as a rooting jar. And I noticed last week that somebody's going to die and it (laughs) might be the jar. (laughs) In your case, see, you'll have to take a sharp knife and make a, uh, a vertical cut. Yeah. Down in there. It's the only way you're ever going to get that thing out of there. Well, yeah, because it has that tiny, well, it's not tiny, but it's, you know, probably about a five inch diameter top, but then that pot swells out and goes back in and yeah, there's no pulling it out. It's really, an, I guess I've learned over the years to be really careful with my with my special pots, you know, like I have some pots that my mother has passed on, but you know, they're still here with me and I don't want to lose them. But um, some plants grow so enthusiastically that yeah. you have to either break or cut the pots off the roots. And um, I mean, it's just going to happen. Mm-hmm. So you know, I, I, that's what's going to happen with those cuttings I rooted. I mean, I've smashed. <laughs> the rooting jars off of a lot of things. (laughs) (laughs) Note to self, use something that you don't care about. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Now, one of the plants that I have to ask you about, I'm just curious, is um, the ponytail palm because I think these guys are so neglected often. You want to talk about um, the tips of the leaves turning brown. Oftentimes they come in those pots that are covered in rock. I think people think they're indestructible. They don't really need a lot of care. What's your experience with ponytail palms? 
Well, they do need attention and care because they're one of those plants, the whole palm group. Um, if you don't get the light right, you're going to have an unhappy plant. You know, it's, it's not you, proper water level is, is um, related with palms to what they're planted in. They want a really loose, chunky bark, you know, flow through potting medium. Um, and so you have to kind of factor that in. And it's one of the, if I had a, a large palm of any size, I'd start judging its um, moisture by weight where you pick up um, the corner of the pot and tip it, you know, like don't pick up the whole palm, but just tip it enough so that you can tell that that pot is heavy or light. And then you'll know, oh, wow, it's dry as a bone, or okay. I, don't, I don't think I need to water it. And um, ponytail palm is, is not unlike other palms, except it has that reservoir, which, although it looks n- nice and plump, it's very woody inside. Oh, it so, is. So it's not going to hold a lot of moisture. Okay, so this neglect that uh, they often experience with with um, unfamiliar homeowners is is just the opposite of what they need. Yeah, they need some attention. If you want, I, <laughs> I had an aunt who was a world traveler, and she says spider plants is the most neglect tolerant house plant there is. You know, we we kind of had a thing going of whether it was uh, which one could you leave for six weeks and come back and water it and it would be okay. Well, you know, a lot of the succulents, you can do that. <laughs> They'll just perk right up. Yeah, You can't do that with uh, ponytail palms. You can, or, or with any palms, they do require yeah. ongoing care. Um, the bromeliads, you can kind of neglect. Sometimes some of those can kind of grab what they need from the atmosphere, but those air plants, it's, it's kind of hard to neglect them too much. Hmm. You know, when I was growing up, my mom had, I want to say like a six to eight foot tall Diefenbachia in the back porch. And that was just the, the house plant that I'll forever associate with my childhood. Those kinds of super tall Diefenbachias are not in yet, but I'm waiting for them to make a comeback. They were, they have fallen out of fashion. It used to know, it used to be everybody knew what diffies were. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but and and some of them have gone quite colorful. There have been some strains introduced um, that have bronze and yellow blushes in the leaves, or or reddish leaf margins that are really quite lovely. And some of these diffies, they'll, they'll change colors a little bit in the light. So they're wonderful office plants. Yeah. You know, they are they just sit there. Yep. Um, they're not bomb-proof, and they're subject to salt buildup. They, they do mm. need a lot of watering. But here's where we can talk, because we are talking foliage plants, and because of the success of um, the scientists, I think it's at Mississippi State, on how house, house plants clear the air of, of pollutants and toxins. And, and um, Dr. Wolf's research down there, it's kind of a spaceship type module where they crowded in bunches of plants and, and exposed them to different environmental toxins and what are those vox, volatile organic compounds. Yeah. And then came out with this list of 20 plants um, are the ones you need to clean the air. In reality, any plant you have to water a lot is is doing a great job of cleaning the air because they are working. They mm. are breathing. They are pumping. Um, whereas a, a you know, a uh, ponytail palm that you might neglect. It's not doing much to clean the air because it's just sitting there. Yeah. So the different bakias do require, you know, some upkeep because um, those broad leaves, you know, they're, they're going to need water. But I think they're one of the top plants for cleaning the air because anything you have to water a lot yeah, is going to be breathing more. Yeah. Well, and they are kind of like uh, the peace lily, you know, with that. I mean, the peace lily is like, I think, the ultimate indicator of I need water because they can look absolutely dreadful. And then you can water them and it's just like, hey, who are you? 
<laughs> you just get resurrection plant, basically. But so those. Well, plants- I know, and it's. I don't think that it's a good plant to have. I, I don't think it's a happy plant to no. have in the house. And is my mother's church. It's great church. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> most people receive more plants at funerals than they want to take mm, home. True. And they always want to leave something at the church. Can we leave this beautiful plant at the church? Mm. And the church's policy is we only keep prayer plants. Oh, really? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and it's a big church. So, you know that if you want, you know, to leave behind uh, a plant, you're welcome to leave behind the prayer plants. <laughs> and the beauty of it, Jen, is it, once you bring it home, it may never bloom again. <laughs> 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 and you'll think it's your fault. Whereas if you leave it at the church, the m- people that take care of the plants only have to know how to take care of one kind of plant. And when oh. it starts looking ugly, they can trash it and replace it with something new. <laughs> okay. All right, note to self. I'm like, why would they pick that one out of all the plants to take? That would not be my choice. No. I, in fact, I had a... Uh, for my dad's funeral, I had a plant that I kept for a good long time. But, I, you know, I've kind of gotten over that. You help shepherd enough people to their heavenly reward, and then you start thinking, I don't have to be burdened with these plants if I don't want to. Mm. I can have something else. Yeah. And uh, you get to do that. Yeah, very true. How about other foliage plants that we should be talking about? Anything else kind of make your list right now, Barbara? Well, you know, I don't know. Some of it is kind of what you come into. And because some of the foliage plants are quite large, and I've already <laughs> given my little plug for, for the little ferns. I, I really do like the little ferns. Yeah. So um, so those are a lot of fun. Yeah. But, you know, whatever strikes you um, is is maybe what what you should do. Some plants have come in and out of style when I, I've got the book in front of me. And when I, when I look through it, I, I can say, oh, I remember when those purple velvet plants were everywhere. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> now nobody wants them. And then there was a, a palm period when... Um, interior spaces kind of got more solar. All of a sudden, you started seeing all these palms. But that's kind of, they're, they're more and more pretty much office plants, I think. I like the arrowhead plants. There are a couple of different kinds. Those are the, they're a green plant that just kind of, um, they ramble around a little bit. But I, I, I think of them as kind of talkative green plants. They're easy and they respond to different places. So they'll look leggy sometimes in low light and then just pick right up. Hmm. So. I see one in your book that I've never tried, and it's the brake fern. Yeah, those are little, those are nice little ferns, um, and you will see them in the box stores, you know, just as, you know, fern A, fern B. Some of them are, have very funky, cool foliage that's, it's not made in here, but it's um, really finely cut. I like ferns because of that, their, their softness and their fuzziness. And, yeah. And the, and the petiteness of some of the better potted ferns. So hmm. I have this thing right now where I don't like Schifflera. What's wrong with me? You just don't like it? Yeah, I just don't. I don't know. I think I've OD'd on them. I, I had it for, I've I had one for so many years. And then I get discouraged when I do go, you know, house plant shopping a little bit. I'll just kind of cast about for a new plant. And I'll be like, oh, it's just Schifflera City out here. Well, maybe we should just acknowledge that with houseplants, as with a lot of things, you can have a been there, done that, you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm not anti Chef Lara by <laughs> any means, <laughs> but I've had, now that I think of it, I've had one that had the large leafed kind, and then I had one with leaves half the size. And maybe I'm done with Chaplaris too, mm-hmm. besides that it's hard to spell. Yeah. It's missing it. an E. <laughs> <laughs> when somebody doesn't know what it is and then you say that's what it is, they're like, <laughs> <laughs> It's a gorgeous name. I'm just over it. (laughs) You know, I think I'm differentiating these days more and more um, between 
indoor plants that are most appropriate for large spaces like shopping malls and offices. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you go in hospital main waiting areas, you're going to see gorgeous indoor plants, you know, that they often hire firms to, to make sure that they're the space of all the spaces in the hospital is full of nice plants because it makes people feel better. It improves your tolerance for pain. Of course, today's world where you do have to think about cleanliness more and more, you know, it, mm-hmm. it has that oasis of, of oxygen there in, in the main part of the hospital. But those are those institutional plants are not the same ones that we're going to get more joy from yeah. in, in our homes. And I think Chefalera is one of those. If, if I were to um, be waiting at the veterinarian's office in the company of a Chefalera, I'd be very happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to having it in my house, yeah. taking yeah. up. Six square feet. Uh, how about finding, you know, finding house plants in unusual places? This past summer, I went to the Garden Bloggers Fling, and uh, it was in D.C. I think the biggest surprise I had was going into this garden where there was a lot of Spanish moss incorporated, but he had these beautiful iron window boxes that had Spanish moss draping out. And then over the Spanish moss, one of the plants that he'd used in this very shady front garden in these window boxes was Wandering Jew. And I was like, Uh. are you kidding me? I was, I, I could hardly... I couldn't even like keep moving. People had to pass me. I just was so taken with it. It was an unexpected thing to see a house plant. Well, in you know, with the like Spanish that. moss, you can buy in bags at Walmart. <laughs> you, get, <laughs> you get that wonderful gray color that's felted. Yeah. You know, so you have this soft, you know, luminous gray. And um, so, you know, you put anything purple with that and it's going to look great. You, that you said wandering to that that was back in the 70s during the Green Revolution Part 1. Um, every hippie had a wandering Jew because, you know, you could just break off a piece and stick it in some dirt and yes. grow. But I, I was recently part of a, a discussion where people were talking about the most unusual way they ever obtained houseplants. And, and people do steal, you know. Oh, gosh. <laughs> This one woman said that she was in the uh, vestibule of the church waiting for the wedding, and she just had to take a cutting. She just had to have it, you know, and <laughs> stuck it in her bra. Anyway. <laughs> 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 it was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, there are a lot of people in the cities. You know, they'll see a, a discarded plant and and pick it up and bring it home and nurse it back to life. I don't, oh I yeah, don't do that. Well, my thing is, if I am bringing out, let's say I get a a tray of succulents at a big box store. You know when you get a tray of succulents, if you take all the pots out of the out of the tray, there's all those little babies that have popped off. And I mm-hmm. never, when I'm packing them up, I never let those babies just sit there and die. I, I scoop them all up and pitch them in the box as I'm heading out the door. Yeah. Because they're viable. They're good to go. But um, Well, you know, and sometimes you'll get more plant than, than you bargained for. Um, I hadn't had not had for for some time a Swedish ivy, oh. and in the town where I live has a destination fabric store quilters from all over come there, and they had this gorgeous Swedish ivy plant by the entryway, and as you know, I was paying for my stuff, and they know me by face anyway. I said. Is it all right if I take a one cutting off that Swedish ivy plant? And and she said, Yeah, that'll be all right. Oh, that was great. And I said, I bet a lot of people have taken cuttings. And she looked at me and she said, Uh huh, them's that's asked. <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of people just take them and don't ask. And so I'll have to say, you should always ask before you take a cutting from a plant. You know, I'm so glad you brought up Swedish ivy because I'd forgotten all about that plant, but I used to have that when we were first married. My mom had a Swedish ivy. I love Swedish ivy. 
Well, it's hard. And one of the things I've learned about Swedish ivy is if you want the blooms, which I'm not sure I really do, I kind of like it as a foliage plant better mm-hmm. than a bloomer that drops its little florets all over the floor. Um, but tough love in the summer. We're talking about an Australian ground cover weed. Oh, is that what that, it is? Um, yeah, that's, that's its ancestral home. And so I have found that if... In early summer, I just give them a haircut, you know, and cut the plant back to like three inches. Okay. And maybe repot it or, le- you know, leach the impurities out and, you know, give it a restart. <clears throat> but then just kind of let it semi cook in, in filtered shade and give it some water, you know. And and they will restart, and as soon as you bring them in, and in the early winter, they just burst into bloom. Honestly. And so, it's like, until I abused them, I didn't realize that's what they wanted. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to find more Australian desert plants or, or, or uh, weeds, basically, if that's... If that's uh, what a Swedish ivy is, because that but see now learn. I'm kind of and I, see I'm Swedish by ancestry, so I thought oh maybe they're Swedish and then found out they were Australian, <laughs> you know, fox on me. <laughs> it was like, but, <laughs> but see now I'm getting to the been there done that with those, you know, okay. and and ready to uh, play yep. with something else for a while. Yeah, see, and I took a nice long hiatus with the kids. I haven't had I have not had a Swedish ivy in twenty years, and now that sounds really good to me. So. So, yeah, to each his own, right? Let's talk about houseplant care. Your the back section of your book is devoted to that. So, well, you know, you have to develop a certain um, vocabulary with plants. You know, yeah. most of your listeners already know things um, that are like in <clears throat> what botanical names are and things like that. But for others, a houseplant is their first entry into the green world. And so there's a bit of a language discussion going on in there. And talk about pots and, you know, clean up. Yeah. Let's talk about this term interior scaping and then some of the skills that you've acquired along the way as you've been working with houseplants all this time. Well, you know, and, and since I've been working with house plants, the ideas of feng shui have kind of come and gone. Mm, um, true. But that's one of the things that, that really uh, attracts me about house plants these days is, let's say, you know, you, you got them where you're going to put them. Well, you walk in the door and you want to immediately have, I think, three spots of green, one quite near the entryway so that you're welcome to the indoors with an indoor plant and then one more distant across the room so that they're connected and then another at some other point in the triangle. And so in addition to satisfying a certain energy flow, so if you could envision energy coming in your front door from plant one, two, three, ah, we're so happy now. Um, <laughs> it, it also, you know, frames the interior. And um, so I like to use that, uh, you know, thumbnail of three that I'm borrowing from Feng Shui um, as a starting point of where you're going to put what. And then we go back to what, you know, what we were talking about with the, the home reno shows and how when they had the, the um, houses staged, there will be these sculptural plants all of a sudden against this wall or in this corner. Yeah. Um, and that's more to anchor and define the space. Just like I'm saying, I want a bushy rubber plant. Well, assuming I get what I'm asking for. <laughs> It's going to actually fill a hole in in my living room furniture constellation where it will look like it's growing up from the floor. Mm. Yeah. Well, and you're right when you said uh, fill a hole in your furniture. I thought, you know, when we were first married, that's what I did. Talk about filling holes. I had house plants everywhere. We just didn't have much furniture. So <laughs> <laughs> they're fantastic for that. But yeah, you're right. 
Sometimes they're better than furniture, you know. In the age of minimalism, you can maybe get by with less furniture and more plants. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm really curious. Do you have many plants hanging from the ceiling? Well, the aforementioned Hoya hangs from the ceiling. And even though, you know, many years ago, (laughs) I I was younger and more limber, and I did my own macrame, but recently, uh, a couple of years ago, I bought some nice macrame pieces off Etsy from some people who have preserved the art. So I have uh, three of those, you know, right now. What's up there? There's a Swedish ivy up there, Um, and the Hoya is year-round, doesn't move, stays in place. It's big. <laughs> okay. I love it. And it's it's a hanger. I like hanging, you know, the hanging plants. And of course, it extends um, how much window space you have available. Yeah. And since you live in a cold climate, and where I live, we have win- winter wind storms, I call them. Where Where I grew up, we didn't have this. Where the north wind starts howling at 40 miles an hour and doesn't stop for 36 hours. But <laughs> <laughs> and so, for example, if I have the equivalent of um, window quilts almost, they're, you know what Roman shades are where you oh, pull yeah. the... Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I, I went on the internet, found out how to make them and made Roman shades for the north windows. <laughs> <laughs> Those make great plant windows, but... You know, there's only so much floor and shelf space under them. Yeah. And um, it's easier to do the winter shades. We only put them down at night, you know, to help keep the cold out. Um, And they don't interfere with the plants that are hanging like they do the plants on the shelf, Mm -hmm. I have to say. Well, and there's that temperature drop that you're wanting, you know, in the evening. They're getting that. I mean, the quilts are probably helping a little bit, but... They're getting that temperature drop, so they're probably happy, too, sleeping better. Yeah, yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that the only uh, precaution is if you're putting something in a hanging basket that's going to stay put. Um, With my Hoya, I wish I had put a better um, tray to catch the water Mm -hmm. because you end up with water all over the place. Yeah. Um, I've got some junk towels now that when I'm <laughs> watering mm-hmm. them, I just throw the junk towels yeah. down and let them drip, yeah. you know, and um, that kind of solved that problem. But if I'd had a better tray under that pot, I wouldn't have to go to that trouble. Yeah. You know, I got a under mine. It's so funny you're mentioning that under my Hoya. I, it just came, I don't know how I found this dumb thing, but it's one of those, it's a clear, it, it's a clear, uh, squishy plastic liner, um, and it, it's very flimsy. I keep waiting for it to crack, but that's what my Hoya is in. So it's kind of like in a, a, a pot, and then that's the the base yeah, for it. Yeah. And I love that because I know if I order over water, I can put you know probably a gallon in there, and and it would be able to hold <laughs> it. <laughs> but you're right when you've got something like that. Mine's in it in a very tall iron plant stand, and um, yeah, so. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. You know what I did for my uh, hanging plants? Because I did the same thing. I bought some macrame recently. Of course, that kind of delights you when you've had this break from it. And, you know, you remember, you know, put, making that. I remember sitting on the floor macrame my buns off. Yeah, so. I, would, I would do the loop account, uh, on my big toe. <laughs> yeah, me too. Oh, my gosh. I love you. You know, yes, and sit yes. there, well, I, at my age, I don't think I want to do this <laughs> form of yoga anymore. No, but I, I, so. I have vivid <laughs> memories of that. I macrame a little angel that's on my Christmas tree with the uh, brass ring for her halo. and um, But yeah, so I mean, I, I did the same thing. I got some macrame. And um, what I did this year is we didn't put up a Christmas tree. But when I was going to one of our local nurseries, I found that they had brought uh, just some dead trees, just some dead trees from the woods and had put those in their Christmas tree holders and then used that to show their ornaments. And it was less, it was easier to see the ornaments because you weren't fighting all the green. And so um, I thought, you know what? That's what I'm going to do. So I took the dog on a walk and in my bright sunny corner where I keep all my, most of my house plants, I went and found this, this tree, brought it in, 
and set it up. And then instead of having to drill holes in my ceiling, I could hang my macrame from some of the branches. And so that was nice. My, yeah. So that was my little like, ooh, I did this. I got this all done. But I, and I love it. It's just kind of a fun little spot for the house plants. And then I did find these fake air plants to tuck among the tree. They look cute, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a realist. We live in Minnesota. It is. It's tough for me to keep air plants alive. So, um, I just well, it's I probably just get gets so dry indoors. You know. Oh gosh, I tell you, it is I, I'm so dry. always surprised at how quickly oh. the plants dry out when yes. when the heat is on during the really cold. Oh. Stuff. Yeah, it is. And tough. of course, they get the plants get dirty during the yes. winter, and some of them are hard to clean. The ones with big leaves, you can just do it by hand. You know, put one hand under the leaf and a and a soft cloth and just wipe them off. And that always feels good. That's one of the things I like about the rubber plant is it gives you such a satisfying yes. cleaning experience. Yeah, yeah. It's so great when you get them all tidied up. You know, I will kind of in late spring when it's warmed up and we have, it's over 70 degrees and raining. If I'm home, I'm running house plants in and out, giving them a natural shower. Oh, that's such a great idea. <laughs> I mean, they won't be out there long enough to acclimate. We're talking a couple of hours, but yeah. Go out in the rain, you fool. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Let's do that. Let's make a let's make that a plant. Plus you get the beautiful smell of the spring rain. It's just fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I even have an old grandfather jade plant that I'll very carefully oh. carry outside and make it take a once a year shower. <laughs> for sure. I love that. It's just a, a general sense of well being, that's for sure. You know, and some people don't realize that, you know, of course that's beneficial for the plants because it opens their pores and they can do a better job of processing light, but cleaning your windows can have the same effect. You know, you're going to have these little white deposits on your windows and windblown rain, especially when there's been a lot of salt used around, um, cleaning them up can increase light significantly. Yeah, that's a great tip. And and what do you do with refreshing potting soil? I mean, I really don't do that all that often. Do you have a regimen that you follow? No, I'm a big believer. Gen- See, I don't like to repot unless I have to. And once plants have reached the size I like, I just assume they stayed that way. Okay. So <clears throat> if possible, and of course, there's the caveat, if possible, <laughs> you know, I will hold the plant sideways and use a fork or a table knife to scrape off the top inch. And a lot of times that soil after a year or two is nothing but crumbles of salt and crusted something. You know, it's it's not really serving the plant. And every time water evaporates out of the pot, some small amount of salt is left behind. And when it gets to the point where you see that wet rim of white inside the pot, you kind of have a salt issue going on, and, and some plants are more tolerant than others. But I'll, t- I'll get rid of that top inch of soil and then put an inch of new soil on top. Okay. To almost everything. Um, but some things, some things you can't. We were talking about holiday cactus, a Christmas cactus. Um, it's wall-to-wall root yeah. all the way up to the soil surface. There's nothing to scrape, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're right. Mine, mine is in a pot, and when I water it, it has. Um, it's in a little uh, glazed pot, little round pot, and when I water it, I can just tip it right upside down, and it's... <laughs> It doesn't go anywhere because it is so root bound. Yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes you can take uh, like a wood or a bamboo skewer like you'd make shish kebabs with or even a toothpick and go around and make um, little holes. And that way you're not injuring too many roots at once and increasing the chances that you're going to get that root ball moist occasionally. I talked about my very old jade plant, which is not a big jade plant. It's more like, you know, a bonsai jade plant. It's not (laughs) growing anymore. But um, once it dries out, it will not take on water, you know. And that's something that, again, I was talking earlier about using the weight of a pot to decide whether or not the plant needs water or is dry or or whatever. Um, And and that can can be really helpful 
in the situation where the interior root ball has dried out completely. And it's it's like repelling water. It's so dry. Yeah. And when you water the plant, it just goes around the edges and down the inside of the pot where where the soil has pulled away because it's mm-hmm. so dry. Yep, that's right. And will linger for just a minute at the bottom and then just flo- float away. And the only way to rehydrate that plant is to let it sit in water for 30 minutes, huh. you know. We had talked in the in the pre-chat a little bit about poisonous plants, and you mentioned that whenever you speak about house plants, this invariably comes up, this issue of poisonous or toxic house plants, especially when it comes to pets. Yeah, especially when it comes to pets. Human animals um, are usually pretty adept at figuring out this tastes terrible. And most of the poisonous plants have a latexes or other bitter compounds. And that's, you know, one of the warning signs is that this may not be good to eat if it's making my mouth burn. You know, when I was writing this book, my middle brother is a, is a small animal vet. And I said, how many poison cases do you actually see of mm-hmm pets that have eaten house plants and really gotten sick. And he said, very few. He said, really? what you get is pets that have gotten bored oh. and gotten into all kind of trouble, whether it's a house plant or something else. Huh. And to, to you know, get, make sure that, you know, pets get adequate supervision and, and exercise and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But uh, I... I was taking care of my daughter's cat while she was traveling for two weeks. And he's an indoor cat, and he's a good cat and everything. And he was in my office, and I noticed movement, and he's messing with a philodendron plant, which is on the no list. You know, in the book, I do have a list of, you know, plants to be careful of. And he was had figured out that this was just like a new game. (laughs) And, you know, at this point, I do doubt this individual cat's intelligence. So <laughs> I had to move the plant. You know, I had to take the plant out of the room. It was the only thing to do. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and put it up on top of a bookcase where he couldn't reach it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, my old, my, I've got a 13-year-old cat, and to her, the idea of eating a leaf from a house plant is so ridiculous. She'd never <laughs> consider it. Really? Yeah. So it's, it just varies from animal to animal. You know that my little border um, got too curious and I had to intervene and, and take away a plant that could have been dangerous, whereas the cat that lives here forever, she would just never. <laughs> <laughs> So it's going to vary with the animal, and but I certainly wouldn't leave a, a poisonous plant within reach of a puppy. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and I love the connection that you made between boredom and their mischievous behavior when it comes to house plants because that's something that right. And it, it, is it a cat's fault that they go to yeah. the bathroom in a large pot? <laughs> When it was accessible to them, it yes. looks like good dirt, and their cat box is nasty. However, I have known cats that would do anything to mess up a, a house plant. You can put aluminum yeah. foil over the top, and the, and the cats will stay away. But. Yeah, yeah. They're not just being destructive for destructive sake. They're you well. Know, they're no, I have had a cat stuff. or two. <laughs> 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 and I, I seem to have some remote memories of coming home to ha- houseplants that were um, p- puppyfied. They weren't poisonous, but, you know, got interested in that alo, and look what happened. Yeah, and there you go. Oh, my gosh. We have to talk about your little hack for using parts of the aloe plant. I have to have you talk about that because you do such a great job with that. Well, where I, it may be the strain I have. I've had this particular strain about 10 years and I've given away dozens, but oh. it's, a, it's a real, you know, a pup producer. It makes little offshoots. And so usually um, in the fall, I'll have a plant that's overgrown and I don't really want to keep it through the winter. And so you can take the big aloe leaves, aloe leaves and chop them into maybe two inch pieces and just breathe them. 
And in the winter, when you have a burn, which I did, I burned my foot this November, it was so great. You can just, you know, pop out a piece of the frozen alo and put it on the burn and you get a double benefit because you're getting fresh, never processed alo sap and it's frozen and it's so comforting. It feels good. Yeah. Yeah, really good. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And you didn't have to go and murder, (laughs) not murder, but you didn't have to lop off a perfectly good aloe leaf and make the plant asymmetrical. I know. That's what I loved about it is there's so much strategy involved because you're getting the little pups anyway. Yeah. 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 And every, you know, if, if that's the only indoor plant you have, you should have an aloe plant because they really, the sap really will heal a burn. It's miraculous. Well, any other tips or advice you want to talk about here before we wrap up today? We've covered a lot. Yeah, we do. You know? Now, and, and you've made me think about things I haven't thought about in a long time. <laughs> well, likewise. I did have to once smash uh, a, an heirloom pot because it was the only way to... Everything was going bad. The plant was going bad. The pot had already had a crack in it. This is how you learn. Yeah, so. it is. Well, I, I loved your advice on on rescuing my bean pot. And so that's on my list now. I'm going to do it. Oh, yeah, I do. You know, because those special pots, you have to keep them. Yeah, you're right. I would feel worse about losing the pot than I will about losing this mother-in-law tongue for sure. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, when you repot a mother-in-law's tongue, a lot of times on the roots, you'll see the little buds. That's right. And they're they're all around the edge. So it's time. It's time. I, I, I'm probably on a clock when it comes to rescuing my bean pod here. I do have one last question, though, that I thought of I was going to ask you, and that has to do with top dressing, whether it's with glass pebbles or stone or mulch. I did a, a container once, and I put eggshells over the top, and then I found this little fairy that was stepping. And so the theme that I used was walking on eggshells. Oh, how sweet. Yeah, kind of a fun little thing. But do you do a lot of top dressing on your indoor house plants? or on in your containers in general? You know, I don't because um, I just don't pay that much attention to that little part of things. But if I did work with succulents or cacti more, you know, I have a few that I have right now, but they're not like in arrangement. Or what you're doing, you know, is, is um, really developing a theme and a scene. Mm-hmm. And I've thought about next time I, I do get bold enough to repot my elderly jade to come kind of take it in a bonsai direction, you know, with a broader pot where I would be using little stones and bits of moss and and stuff like that on top. I've used sand some just because it's nice and clean. And when I am battling fungus gnats, sometimes I'll I'll use sand and it just seems to make them a little bit easier to manage. Oh, I like that idea. I don't think they like that too much. But I love your idea of the pulverizer, the crunched up eggshells being a surface. Um, you know, I've used pebbles a lot and the glass beads. I, to me, they don't usually work. You know, like I'll try them and realize it doesn't look very good. Yeah, what is it about those? Yeah, those darn glass beads. I tell you, it's such a great idea until you go to put it in in action and then they're sinking in and you got dirt all over them and debris and it just, I, I start to go crazy and then I... If I have to take care of that container at some point, you know, the plant's dead and I want to redo it, then I got to pick all those rocks out. It drives me crazy sometimes. Yeah, they work great in water, but yeah. I think that's their best use is in water. So. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Well, Barbara, I tell you what, the back of your book says discover gardening in the great indoors. And I think we've covered it all today. So I'm very, very It's pleased. been great fun. Yeah. I really appreciate you inviting me to do this. Well, I definitely wanted to talk to you about it today. And, and who better than you to talk about it? I love your book. You did a great job on it. And it has been translated into some other languages. Yes, this book has been translated into Russian and into Polish. I'm going to take pictures of those covers and send them to you so you'll see it. It's Uh, really cool. Yeah, that is cool. That is cool. 
Well, I wish you good luck this spring with some house plants and some spring flowering bulbs and trying some new things, which I'm sure you'll be doing. Same to you. I hope that your Hoya blooms abundantly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Thanks for being on the show. This was great. Yeah, thanks. We will talk again soon. All right. Bye. Well, that's it for our show today about how to keep, not kill, your houseplants with Barbara Pleasant, the author of The Complete Houseplant Survival Manual. I hope today's show turned your head a little bit away from the powerful call of spring gardening, which is just around the corner, and caused you to give another closer look at houseplants. This is the best time of year to give them a refresh and a reset. And of course, fill in your personal plant library, adding another orchid, a cactus, or even a sentimental favorite like the Swedish ivy. And don't forget, you can find Barbara's best-selling book, The Complete Houseplant Survival Manual, on Amazon. Last time I checked, it was selling for $14.67. And there'll be a link to that in the Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast group. Just a reminder that the show notes for this episode will be under the Still Growing Podcast page over at my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And don't forget, while you're there, you can click on Facebook group. It will take you right into the Facebook group where you can just request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group, in the listener community. I'm so thankful to my team at Podfly Productions. I want to thank my editor and project manager, Eric Begay, and my copywriter, Ein Kadena. I'd also like to thank the women who make up my listener advisory board, Beth Engel, Beth Gardens in Illinois. She works at Griffin, a national brokerage firm, and one of the finest companies in horticultural service. Beth is also a board member of the PPA, the Perennial Plant Association. Denise Pugh, Denise Gardens in North Mississippi and is a contributing writer to Mississippi Gardener Magazine. Amy Von Atchen, Patricia Chandler Newport. Patricia is the owner of Backyard Urban Gardens out of Kego Harbor, Michigan. Deb Gibson and Peggy Ann Montgomery. Peggy Ann is the brand manager over at American Beauty's Native Plants. And she was featured back in episode 553, where we talked all about how to incorporate more native plants into your landscape. For my sign off today, I leave you with this thought to help you grow. How can you bring more green into your home? Do you have houseplants at your front door to greet visitors? Can you start propagating some new plants to give as Mayday gifts to your friends and neighbors? Spending some time each week tending houseplants is a form of meditation that can decrease anxiety and increase your happiness. Have a great week, everyone. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a SixFootMama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. Okay, I've got it now. Here we go. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Barbara Pleasant is back on the show today, and she's the author of the... I bit my tongue. Ow. <laughs> With that, let's transition to the topic of today's show. Why is that not recording? When it comes to her celebrated book, The Complete Houseplant Survival Manual, there goes that alarm again. I notice something that I don't often experience. Why is that alarm going off? In Sustainability, Gardening Jones shared a wonderful post that's called, What are Heavy Feeder Vegetables? This is a, this is, the University of York had a, uh, that was a great image making its way around social image. Social image. Mm -hmm. So check that out. A recommended list of 12 Instagram feeds for flower lover. (laughs) For flower. (laughs) 
Oh my gosh. Boop. A recommended list for flower. Boop. A recommended list for flower. Boop. Flower lover, flower lover, flower lover, flower lover, flower. Got it. Boop. Trying to make the sound for the blooper thing. Boop. No. Boop. No. How about this? Boop. Boop. Wait. Hang on. Okay, I got it. Beep. No, that's not it. Boop. Close. Boop. That's it.